So again, let me let me just redraw my little representative cube. Now, this what I'm about to do here is really sort of beyond the scope of of this class. Uh, I'm going to use some tensor notation and manipulations and stuff, and I certainly won't uh, ever ask you to do do this in a derivation. But I do, I do want to just show you that this BO coefficient is not just some arbitrary correction factor, but you can, it comes from mechanical arguments. So we have this poro elastic material that's subject, subject to a far field pressure P. Okay, so it's, e, it's hydrostatic, it's equal and opposite on all sides. And internally, there's a pore pressure and we'll assume that that's also equal to P. Right? So there's a pore pressure in all the pores, also equal to P. So if I examine a little piece of the matrix material here, right? so if I, if I were to take that and say pull it out, and draw another free body diagram, it's also going to be subject to an external pressure. What is that external pressure going to be? Assuming that the thing's in equilibrium. What is my little piece of, you know, away from the pores, my little piece of solid material here, what, what is the hydrostatic pressure on it? P, right? It has to be. If the thing's in equilibrium, it's not moving around, it has to be P. <coughs> All right? So, uh, I'm going to write down, I'm going to use some tensor notation here. But, so I'm going to have the, the stress tensor IJ where I and J go from 1 to 3, right? So I just, it's tensor or matrix notation, right? I can decompose that guy, and I, I showed it for the strain tensor earlier, but I, I can de decompose that thing into something we'll call a deviatoric part and a hydrostatic part. Right. So just like I said before, the deviatoric part is the stress that sort of develops due to shear strains, okay? The hydrostatic part is due to hydrostatic compression, okay? Now, this is where I deviate a little bit. I use some, uh, I, I use some shorthand notation here. So you notice I have like sigma KK. What that is is it's shorthand for anytime you see a repeated indice in the, t when you see ten tensor notation like this, and you see a repeated indice in a term, right? So KK is repeated then it's the same thing as saying the sum over that indice. And in this case, it goes from 1 to 3. Right? So this second expression is nothing more than shorthand. The first expression is nothing more than shorthand for the second. Right? So this is actually called Einstein notation. Uh, Einstein developed it. I guess he just didn't like writing those sum signs. So he, dropped, he just dropped, dropped the summation sign. Should be at one third, I think. Okay. Now that thing on the end sort of acts like an identity matrix. That's called a Kronecker delta function. Right? So this sigma ij. It's uh, if i is equal to j, it's one. If y is not equal to j, it's zero. So it's sort of like an identity matrix. So if I can take my total stress and I can split it up into a deviatoric part and a hydrostatic part, okay, then in, in, if I want to write the total stress on my little cube right here, well, there's no deviat it's, it's only hydrostatic. Right? There's no deviatoric stress, right? And so in this case, on the left-hand side, I just have P, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define P. 
I'm going to say that P is equal to minus one-third sigma kk. And for this de derivation and this derivation only, I'm going to use a tension positive sign convention. Meaning other, way, other times in the course we always use compressive positive. But right now, I'm going to use tension positive, and that's why it has a negative sign here. So I'm going to say that P is minus one-third sigma kk. That's just a definition. Uh, so then, my, then my, I can say my total stress is minus P sigma ij. Right. And then we had, we, we had this uh, constitutive model for stress for a linear elastic material, right? That's lambda, the Lamaze parameter, sigma kk delta ij. Again, for the kk, this is the sum of the diagonal entries, the trace of the strain tensor, plus 2 mu epsilon ij. Or we also had, you know, using the bulk modulus, sigma kk delta ij minus 2 mu one third sigma kk delta ij plus two mu lambda ij. This just comes from uh, that the fact that lambda is equal to k minus two thirds mu. So if I just plug in k is you know this is, comes from that chart of elastic models, right? So if I just plug that in for that, then I get this, right? which I can simplify to this. And again, what I've done again is to do this sort of uh, deviatoric decomposition. So I have a, I have a hydrostatic component. Right. The part of the strain that's only related to the dilatation plus the part of the strain that's related to the shear. And in this, for my little solid right there, there's no shear. There's no shear strain. It's under hydrostatic pressure. And so this whole thing is going to be zero. And so then I have Plug, plugging this in, right here, this in for the stress. I have minus P delta IJ is equal to K sigma KK delta IJ. Right. Now strictly I can't just, strictly I can't just Cancel these. There's a delta, there's a sigma ij on both sides of the equation, but these are like tensors, right? And I can't tensors are like matrices. You can't just divide by a tensor. Right? You can multiply by its inverse, but you can't just divide by. It. But I can multiply both sides of the equation. And so I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by sigma ij. Now I have these repeated indices, right? Two of them, in fact. So I'm summing over the i's and then summing over the j's. And it turns out if you work this out according to these rules, this equals 3. Right? Equals 3. And this equals 3. So I have 3 on both sides of the equation. Now I can actually divide it. Right? I can divide both sides of the equation by a number. Right? So that was just a long-winded way to say I can cancel both of those. But strictly, you, you know, you can't just divide by this thing. So I can, I can, can't, I can get rid of those guys, and then I can solve for sigma kk. All right. So then finally, sigma kk is equal to minus p over ks. Right. And then if I plug that back into, so then the total strain is sigma ij minus p over three ks 
そういうのもあるよね。Right. Just using、right. sort of、uh, just using the fact that you know, there's, no, there's no shear strain, so the only, the only part of the strain left is this hydrostatic component. Okay. So that was sort of a very long winded way to derive the total strain on the solid little, little solid piece of material here. So now what I want to do, oops, now what I want to do is write down. The stress for my skeleton, right? So for the whole thing, right? Including the pores. So not just my little solid piece of material, but rather the whole thing.、Right? And we have that the stress is equal to Cijkl sigma Kl. Again, in tensor notation, I'm going to sum over the Kl on the right hand side, and that leaves me with an Ij on the left. C is the, 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 the fourth order tensor, it's the, the elastic constant matrix.、Okay. Well, I can also write this as epsilon KL D KL IJ, sigma IJ. So I basically inverted that relationship where D is the inverse of C in their fourth order tensor. So then the total strain, the total strain for my skeleton here is D KLIJ times the stress. Now, the stress is going to be the effective stress. So that's the total stress plus the pore pressure. I use a plus here because I've switched the sign convention to, to tension. Minus. One third KS P delta IJ. Now, this came from. So, the total strain is the strain of the whole skeleton, including this contribution from any strain in the solid.、Right? And that's this thing where I don't know if I mentioned, but the reason I put a subscript S on this is just to, just to remind you that this is the bulk modulus of, this, of, the, of the pure solid. Not of the whole thing, including the pores, but of the pure solid. Okay? So that's the bulk modulus of that.、Right. Okay? So that's the total strain, right? So then I'm going to introduce my sort of correct or BO effective stress model with this alpha parameter in it. Pij. That's going to be equal to C ij kl f e kl.、Right? So this is my total stress.、Right? Where, you know, remember C ij kl, these, these are the elastic constants of the skeleton, the solid and the pores together. This is what you'd measure in the lab. Because you're not going to take out, you can't take out the pores.、Right? Okay. So then I'm going to plug in this strain right here. And so if I do that, I get C i j k l d k l i j sigma i j plus p delta i j. Minus one third KS P delta IJ. Now you'll just have to kind of take my word for it, but just like when you, when you multiply a matrix by its inverse, you get the identity matrix. If you, if you multiply a fourth order tensor by its inverse, you get the fourth order identity matrix. Okay. And so when you simplify this, We get、uh, delta ij plus alpha p 
ij on this side, and then so del, uh, sigma ij plus p ij minus c i j k l over three k s p k l this should be a, a k l here sorry also here should be a k l Okay. Now, without going through all those arguments again, I'm just going to say that uh, you know I can subtract. Well, I can subtract the stress from both sides. Those are going to cancel, right? That leaves me with only terms that have p's in them. P's are just scalars, so I can divide those away. So if I divide those away, then I have that. Now I'm going to multiply again both sides by delta i j. So I have a delta i j there and a delta i j there. So then I have Delta ij times delta ij is 3 alpha equal to 3 minus cijkl delta kl delta ij over 3ks divide by 3. Then I have alpha equals 1 minus cijkl. I'll put the delta ij there, delta kl there, over 9 ks. All right. And finally, if my material is isotropic, remember, if the material is isotropic, then, then the cijkl only has two independent parameters in it. And that whole thing reduces to 1 minus 9 lambda plus 6 mu over 9 ks. And using the relationship between bulk modulus, what you can see is that this thing, this is, is the bulk modulus of the solid skeleton. And so eventually, this equals 1 minus k over ks. Right? So this is the bulk modulus of the whole thing, including the pores. This is the bulk modulus of the solid matrix skeleton. So that's what BO coefficient is, right? And you should see that for something like, in just one minute, I'll be done. Um, for something like a sand, right, because the, the, you know, something like a sand, which is quartz, right? Quartz is very, very, has a very high bulk modulus, right? So the, 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 an individual grain of quartz is extremely, uh, has extremely high bulk modulus, right? But if I take a whole pile of sand and compress it, well, it's, the grains are going to move past each other, like the skeleton, if you will. The, the grains are going to move past each other. That space in between the sand is going to collapse. And so the, the bulk modulus of the entire sample, the sand and air you know, in a group, is much, much less than the bulk modulus of a piece of quartz. And so then, you know, if you have something that's really big over something really small, th then, you know, the, th the thing approximately, alpha approximately equals zero. Right? I mean, this, this term goes to zero, that, then the alpha is approximately one. For rocks, shales, something like two thirds is more like it. Uh, and then this is the last, conclude this discussion. This is a BO coefficient as a function of pressure, and you can see that it's not a constant, typically because the bulk modulus of the skeleton is not a constant. You know, it, 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 it's a function of the external pressure applied. And so for sands, these are actual measurements of BO's coefficient. Uh, you know, for low pressures, they're around one, and they drop a little bit. And for shells, you can see they're even below a half in this case. Right. So that's uh, BO's coefficient. We'll talk more about poroelasticity on Monday.